Welcome to the Occupied Sun for the Occupy News Network. I'm Anne Narki. These are just some of the stories which were buried by the news that far-right Prime Minister Dave Cameron allegedly face-fucked a dead pig. In recent weeks, the movement for social justice in the UK has seen five love activists jailed in Liverpool, Runnymede Eco Village destroyed, the Ark homeless shelter evicted in Manchester, and now Sweet Stopia has been invaded and evicted. Home for all, we need to keep resisting. There's one and a half million empty buildings out there in the UK. Why should anyone be homeless when there's that many empty buildings? You know, the housing crisis is a lie. Austerity is a lie, it's a government robbery programme. We need to start organising so that everyone's got a home, everyone's got food, everyone's got shelter, the basics. Fever the resistance, big up all the Sweet Smoke resistors today. Come, come down and support, get involved, keep networking, keep occupying, <laughs> occupy everywhere, never give up. The 1% media reported on the Sweet Stopia eviction which began on Wednesday. Has the grotesque spectacle of Piggate provoked a media rebellion or are the establishment just trying to spin a story which is too resonant to ignore? Here are some of the details which were not mentioned in the corporate media coverage. Three arrests were made on Wednesday, yet eviction resistance continued through Wednesday night. A further 14 arrests were made on Thursday as Sweet Stopians continued to resist the eviction of wheelchair user Mustafa, the father of the last family to be evicted from the estate. Demolition crews were apparently waiting in the wings as the eviction was underway. Sweet Stopians rebuilt the homes on the estate, which had been smashed up by poverty developer Annington Homes. Annington bought the homes on the Sweetsway estate for just £400 each. The Sweet Stopians were growing food on the site while launching exciting projects, such as the Noah's Ark campaign to raise awareness of climate change and the plight of climate refugees. A petition against the evictions and demolition of the estate signed by 66,000 people was ignored by the local council. Last Friday, the Ark, an emergency homeless shelter in Manchester, was also evicted by 1% thugs. The Ark was built by homeless people as an alternative to the isolation of surviving on dangerous streets after a previous camp was evicted from outside Manchester City Hall. The group had begun protesting in April, yet suffered an injunction in July. The injunction banned people from sleeping in tents in the city. Mercenaries in high-vis gave residents just 30 minutes to collect their worldly possessions and vacate. Possessions were thrown into skips and members of the shelter were dragged out while half asleep. Seven people are due in court next week, facing large fines and possible prison time. Simon Pook of Lazar Solicitors, who is representing some of the defendants, said, This is not just a legal issue, it is a social issue. You do not solve the problem of homelessness just by moving it on. We are concerned that the Equality Act has not been fully extended to the rough sleepers. In just two weeks, the UK judiciary fast-tracked the eviction from notice of court proceedings to hearings at the county court, then the Court of Appeal, and finally the High Court, for an eviction notice to be served, escalating to violent enforcement. An open letter signed by academics at Manchester Metropolitan University condemned the eviction, expressing concern at the message it sent to students and calling on university bosses to provide support to the homeless people. Rough sleeping in England has risen by 55% since 2010 and by 14% in the past year, with cuts to benefits and homelessness services taking a heavy toll. Matt Downey, Director of Policy and External Affairs for the national charity Crisis, said, While the authorities have a duty to maintain public order, people must be treated with compassion and respect. We are particularly disturbed by reports of people's possessions being thrown away. If you are living on the streets, a small collection of belongings may be all you have left. Manchester City Council must now make good on its commitment to support people to escape the streets and make sure that anyone affected by this action is treated with dignity and respect. There were two separate March for Homes events last Saturday in Haringey and Newham. 
Haringey Defend Council Housing marched to highlight the continued attacks on the poor by Haringey Council and in Stratford, Newham, the Focus E15 mothers marched with the local revolutionary communist group. Focus E15 mothers were celebrating their second anniversary. Both groups have rejected UK Gov PLC policy and are demanding the right to stay in the area. The Ponzi scheme known as the London housing market has apparently become the world's new reserve currency, seemingly more precious than gold. During the marches, class war engaged in direct action, occupying the local Foxton's estate agents. Foxton's are infamous for their tax dodging and for charging unfair fees. The march ended in the abandoned Carpenters' estate where they had previously occupied empty houses. After a failed attempt by the council to sell the estate to property developers, it has remained empty ever since. Those defending council housing are facing off against poverty developers, who in collusion with local councils are destroying homes and replacing them with luxury apartments for the 1% to buy as investments which are left empty. Since Margaret Thatcher started selling council homes, over 2 million have been sold off. 40% of these are now owned by rentier capitalists and London has barely 340,000 council homes left. Three refugee camps in Calais were evicted early on Tuesday morning by Gendarme, Police Nationale and undercover police, the BAC, with unbelievable violence. Hundreds of desperate, vulnerable people were attacked and pepper sprayed by police, who then frog marched them en masse two and a half miles to a former landfill site on the outskirts of Calais, which the 1% media have been calling the jungle. On arriving at the jungle, armoured police proceeded to rip up dozens of tents, charging people with batons and reportedly firing tear gas into the camp indiscriminately. Personal possessions were lost in the violence, at least six people lost their passports, others lost money, phones with vital contacts on, photos and details of dead or missing family members. Diggers and council workers destroyed tents and belongings, loading them onto trucks bound for the municipal dump. Despite having promised not to in their 2015 election manifesto, UK Gov PLC have announced plans to cut free school meals for infants in George Osborne's November spending review. Jonathan Simons from Policy Exchange apparently had the audacity to say... The principle of having a hot school lunch is a good one, but the question really is one of value for money. Is it the best use of £800 million a year to pay for free school meals for all children, regardless of their parental wealth? <sighs> yes, Jonathan, yes. That is the best use for £800 million a year. It should probably be increased, actually, given the parlous state of children's nutrition in this country. Children who have a school meal every day are two months further on in their studies than those that don't. In what disability rights campaigners are describing as a breakthrough verdict, a coroner has concluded that a disabled man killed himself after being found fit for work. In her narrative determination, the coroner Mary Hassel said, The anxiety and depression were long-term problems but the intense anxiety that triggered his suicide was caused by his recent assessment by the Department for Work and Pensions as being fit for work, and his view of the likely consequences of that. A spokesperson for DPAC, Disabled People Against Cuts, said, It is bad enough that DWP practices are clearly a risk to human life, it is worse that they seek to hide information, delay a release, and only when they are forced to, supplying complete data that amounts to misinformation. This amounts to intentional negligence and an urgent, thorough, independent investigation is needed to find out the true extent of what has happened. Until all of these steps are taken, people will continue to die needlessly. John McArdle, co-founder of the grassroots group Black Triangle, called the landmark case the first irrefutable evidence from a member of the judiciary that the Department for Work and Pensions Work Capability Assessment Regime has been directly responsible for the death of a disabled person and that there exists no reliable mechanism for doctors to flag up substantial risk. It is now incumbent on the government to respond swiftly and meaningfully. Not to do so will only tell us one thing, that this is a government that does not care whether disabled people live or die. 
The DWP promised in March that it would develop a pilot programme to test new ways of collecting evidence for ESA claimants with mental health conditions. However, more than six months after making that promise, and more than 18 months since the coroner's report was sent to the DWP, there has been no official statement about any such pilot. The latest attack on Jeremy Corbyn has come from an unnamed British Army general who issued a threat to mutiny if Corbyn becomes Prime Minister. We go now to Tarpaulin Simon for more on this story. Simon. This week, an unnamed British Army general issued a threat by the Murdoch-owned Sunday Times, stating... The armed forces would take direct action to stop the Corbyn government downgrading them. There will be the mass resignations and you would face the very real prospect of an event which would effectively be a mutiny. For most of our lifetime we've experienced the compliant armed forces that have supported the establishment's position. We are supposed to believe that only militaries in faraway lands would challenge and overthrow a democratically elected government. However, this has happened before in the UK. In 1974, the army turned out in the streets to protest Harold Wilson's government under the guise of a training exercise, the army occupied Heathrow Airport. The troops took to the streets. The public was told it was a routine anti-terrorist exercise at Heathrow. In fact, it was a show of force in response to alleged communist infiltration at the airport. The battle for Britain seemed about to begin. I mean, the first thing you do if you want to control a country is to take over the airports, take over the BBC and protect Buckingham Palace with the Queen. Here is a clip from the early 1970s where a general talks about challenging Harold Wilson's government. Fearing Wilson was unable or unwilling to prevent anarchy, former military officers like General Walter Walker and Major Alexander Greenwood began to form private armies. If you plot to destroy this present system, what are you doing? You are committing a form of treason. Jeremy Corbyn apparently represents such a threat to the established plutocracy of corporations and government that the UK once again faces the army breaking ranks to directly protect the 1%. The Occupied Sun asks these rhetorical questions. What is so threatening about a man that has consistently advocated for peaceful solutions? A man who campaigned so passionately against the disastrous war in Iraq. Why is a man who won't speak for the renewal of nuclear weapons of mass Armageddon so threatening to the 1%? Could it possibly be that endless war makes lots and lots and lots of money? We'll leave that for you to decide. We go now to Obi, who's outside Downing Street for... The 1% Media Watch. In a week where the Daily Mail informed us that the UK's far-right Prime Minister, David Cameron, is a pickfucker, we decided to dig a little deeper into the story behind Thickgate. The scandal was released into the right-wing media by former Tory party deputy chairman, Lord Michael Ashcroft, who was in 2009 the 37th richest person in the UK. Ashcroft's current wealth is estimated to be £1.1 billion. Ashcroft is also a non-dom, meaning he is a tax dodger and he is currently sitting in the House of Lords. Lord Michael Ashcroft and David Cameron fell out over the 2010 general election where Ashcroft felt he was owed the cabinet seat after donations of £8 million. Although it's tempting to be consumed in the avalanche of funny memes resulting from the revelation that far-right Prime Minister David Cameron might have partaken in uh, bestialist necrophilia, Laughing along with Ashcroft is playing right into the power game that is the story behind this story. This is a story about who really runs this country. White male billionaires like Michael Ashcroft are not afraid to show leading politicians who is boss. We saw this earlier this summer when another white male billionaire, Rupert Murdoch, published pictures of the Queen throwing the Nazi salute. Even if you are the Prime Minister, even if you are the Queen, don't ever forget who is really in charge. The mental image of a young David Cameron sexually abusing a dead pig is a story beat designed to stimulate the base energy centers in each of us. This is how the 1% media operates. It stimulates our most primal instincts. Lust, jealousy, envy, fear. It's not about selling newspapers, it's about controlling minds. What has been useful about Piggate is that we now know for sure that David Cameron was part of the bulletin club 
has celebrated privilege, wealth, and status over the 99% of normal people. We know that uh, part of the initiation ceremony was to burn a 50-pound note in front of a homeless person. In Oxford, he wanted to join the Pierce Garrison Society with its deviant entrance exam. All this is apparently undisputed. Comrade Corbyn has shown us the way this week by pointedly ignoring the media that savaged him with smear stories in the run-up to the Labour leadership election. If we are to defeat the 1% media, we need to start ignoring them, and unfortunately, as funny as the resulting social media commentary has been, we should really be ignoring Pig Gate too. Okay, this is Obi, outside Whitehall. Peace out. Thanks, Obi. That's it for this week's headlines. Thanks for watching. Please keep sharing news the 1% media won't publish. You are our distribution network.